Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
distraction, Jesus, just to worship you, just to worship you, God. It's all about you. It's all about you, God. We empty ourselves of ourselves. We look on to you, God. We adore you. We worship. We worship. We worship you. Good morning, God's Family Church. Um, we're so glad you're joining us in person or online on Facebook Live. Um, I just want to take the time to remind you of offering. We do have an offering um, tray in the foyer and right here on the right side of the exit door. And you could also um, submit your offering by mail. And you could also support GFC. Um, you could text GIVE to 833 seven five nine zero four nine three to text give to eight three three seven five nine zero four nine three lord heavenly father we just come before you O god thank you thanking you each and every day O god for you are worthy to be praised all glory belongs to you O god and we just take this time, O oh Lord, that you might help us give, O oh God, our offerings unto you to build your church, O oh God, to spread your gospel, O oh Lord, that may, be, may you remind us that the building isn't the church, O oh God, but we, your people, are the church, O oh God, and may we just portray this with our actions, O oh Lord, and we give not just our offerings financially, O oh God, but may we give ourselves unto you, O Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are Alpha and Omega. We
God, we just come before you and we just bring our whole self into this moment. God, as we have been worshiping you um, with our voice, God, I just pray that we would just bring every part of us into this moment, God, our minds and our hearts. God, we are so grateful that we have the opportunity to worship you. Whatever that looks like, God, wherever it might be, if it's in a living room online or if it's here or wherever, God, just let us never forget on this Memorial Day weekend as we, as a nation, as we are remembering sacrifices that took place on behalf of our country, let us never forget the sacrifice that has taken our place and made us right with you, that we can come boldly before you and we can worship you, God. We thank you for that. So we honor you this morning with everything. God, we lift your name up. God, may this time that we spend together bring glory to your name. May we honor you in this time, and all that we do, all that is said, in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Ez. So welcome. Welcome to Gathered Church. And, uh, and I realize that for some, uh, you're gathering online. And so we welcome you, wherever you're at. Uh, We are grateful that you have chosen this morning uh, to worship with us. You know, and we're going to go to the text in here in just a moment. But before we do, I want to talk about the significance of this weekend. This is a hugely significant weekend for a number of reasons. The first, like I I just said in my, my prayer, it's Memorial Day weekend. And, you know, sometimes perhaps in, you know, in day-to-day life and in part of, you know, areas of our culture, maybe Memorial Day weekend ends up just being a, whew, don't have to work on Monday. It's a three-day weekend. And when there's not a global pandemic, we get together and we go have a barbecue or whatever. Um, But really, this is a significant weekend that our nation has set apart to honor those that have sacrificed on behalf of our country. And so I want to encourage you as you go throughout your weekend, um, you know, just remember, remember that. uh, And and just express your gratitude to God. Just honor that in your your mind and in your heart that, uh, that people for generations, whether it's in previous wars or Uh, whatever people have sacrificed, they've given their life for our country in previous generations and then also recently. Because I'm mindful of the first responders who are literally on the front line right now. And I have a former employee, somebody who uh, worked for me at another church and and, and she lost her mother to COVID-19 yesterday. She was a nurse. So I just want to encourage you throughout this weekend, this is a significant weekend. It isn't just a, whew, we don't have to go to work tomorrow. It's a weekend in which we should remember and honor the sacrifices that have been made uh, for things like even gathering together in worship this morning, the freedoms we have in this nation, which leads me to the second point of why this weekend is hugely significant, because We are in gathered worship, those of you that have chosen to come today. This is uh, made possible because people before us fought for the freedom 
for religious freedom that we may gather and worship God. And it's hugely significant um, on this weekend, especially in light of what happened on Friday afternoon, where our president uh, made the declaration that church is essential. Now, now, regardless of, you know, if you voted for our president or not, and regardless of if you align philosophically with our president or not, we, we shouldn't miss the fact that that's hugely significant that the leader of our federal government made the declaration that church is essential. This is a significant weekend. And what's, what's interesting is, you know, a couple of months ago, when states all over the country started to take the, the, the steps that uh, started to put in place state home orders and the decisions that were made, uh, what's interesting is as, as governors and as county officials and as mayors were, were navigating that two months ago in March, what's interesting is they were all going, they were all operating within the, fa the framework uh, where our, our federal government had defined that there were, um, I, I think it's eight, maybe ten, essential industries. And I've got the document on my laptop. So, so the federal government said, hey, we have a pandemic. We have an issue, and we have to take some drastic steps. However, the federal government said there are eight or ten industries that are deemed essential. And what's interesting is that the governors and the county officials, and that nobody really argued about those industries. It was just kind of the assumption and the framework that everybody was working in. Now, I know uh, that there were some, you know, some, you know, around the fringes, you know, different interpretations, you know, like in Ventura County, where we live right now, and we're about to move here to Fresno, you know, um, there was a debate on did, did, did bike shops qualify as the transportation industry, and therefore were bike shops essential? So I, I, I get it that in different areas, there were, around the edges, there was kind of like interpretation and stuff like that, but nobody questioned those eight to 10 industries, whether they were essential or not. So this weekend was hugely significant when the leader of our federal government added churches to essential, essential category. So it's a hugely significant weekend. And I realize there were churches around, I'm aware of churches that have already been meeting in gathered worship and I, I love how sarah e put it in her prayer like we are the church the church isn't a building so just by the way the church never stopped but gathered worship began again in some churches before this sunday and i know that there are a number of churches that gathered worship is is beginning again this sunday and then a lot of churches are gathering next sunday so this is a significant weekend as we are relaunching ministry. We're going to do it prayerfully and thoughtfully and carefully with wisdom. But this is a significant weekend. And churches all over the nation are navigating this season. And they're, and they're trying to figure out how do we be the church in this new context. And so churches are trying to figure out how to relaunch different areas of ministry. And I just want to say it's hugely significant for our church, too. Not only are we, like a lot of churches around the nation, trying to figure out how are we going to start relaunching ministry, so we're dealing with a significant transition. But this church has already experienced another transition over the past year, and that's a transition of leadership. So we're also in a new season of relaunching ministry. And what does it look like for us to be effective carriers of the gospel to this region? And, and let me just say, we're going to get to the text in just a second, but let me just say this. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more of this in, in weeks to come, but as we start to think about what God is calling us into in this new season, let me just be clear that in no way are we dismissing the last season. 
In no way are we dishonoring or are we uh, dismissive of the impact and the powerful work that God has done in the previous season. In fact, the season that we're going into would not be possible if we weren't building upon a rich heritage. If we weren't building upon the shoulders of people that have gone before and actually have made this season possible. So as we, as we think about relaunching ministry and, and as we think about what that looks like for children's ministry and what it looks like for engaging our community, um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to extend one step into this next season uh, in my own understanding, in my own wisdom. Like, as we go into ministry, as we go into this next season, we better not be being guided by human ideas. We need to step into the next season being guided by God's ideas. We need to be, what is God's perspective? What is God's perspective? How would God say that we should be relaunching ministry? What does God have to say? And that's one of the reasons that I'm going to take the next two Sundays to start talking about Pentecost. So I just wanted to, I wanted to take the time. I didn't want to try to, to talk about Pentecost just in one Sunday morning. I wanted to lay the foundation this morning because many would say that Pentecost was the launch of the original church. So I don't know about you, but when I think about how we begin to relaunch ministry here, I, I want God's perspective. What was, what was guiding things at the very start? What's God's heart on this? So it's a hugely significant season that we're moving into. And we're going to look at Acts. We're going to start in Acts chapter 2. And you can start working your way there. But let me say exactly one more reason why this season is super critical. Not only... Are we, like a lot of churches, figuring out how to re-ramp up ministry carefully, safely, appropriately? Lots of churches are doing that. Not only are we as a church in this season where we've transitioned leadership over the past year, but we find ourselves needing to engage a culture that has had a major reset button pushed in the last 60 days. As we step into this new season, it actually, culture is like trying to figure out what, I don't like the word new normal because it's overused and you hear it on the news all the time, but people are really trying to figure out what is this next season going to look like. This is a major transition time and I'm telling you people in culture need hope. They need truth. They need a church that's willing to step into this, this season where people are trying to figure out what's going on. People are in incredible transition on our street alone in Ventura. Three houses in a row, three families are moving this month. Three families. One of our neighbor, two houses down, he was laid off. And for years, they've been trying to figure out when and if and when they would move to North Carolina where they have other family and connections. And, and they've chosen to, in this season, move literally from coast to coast. The, the other neighbor right next to us, I, I don't know. They're moving across town. I don't know the story. Maybe they're having to downsize because of this. I don't know, they haven't shared. Maybe they're actually upsizing because the interest rates are low and they want to take it. I don't know. Um, Karen and I are, are moving to Fresno. And newsflash, my son Judah back there, our 22-year-old son, has decided he just finished two years of Bible college and he just in the past several weeks has decided he's going to move to Fresno with us. But in this season, there's all sorts of people trying to navigate what does... What does the, the next chapter look like? 
So it is imperative for us as a church to be sensitive to what God is saying and to move into this season in the way that God would have us move. One of my favorite compliments in Scripture is in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and it's talking about uh, the tribe of Issachar, one of, the, one of the tribes of Israel. And there's this description of that there were the leaders in Issachar who discerned the times and they knew the steps that Israel needed to take. That's my prayer for our church today, that we discern the times and we know the steps that we should take, what God is asking us to do. And so this is a hugely critical, strategic, and significant time. And I know I've taken a lot of time this morning before getting to the text, but I wanted us to understand this is not just a normal Sunday. This is a new season. So I want to be guided by Scripture. So if you will turn with me to Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at... We're going to look at Pentecost. Again, we're a week ahead of Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday. But I want us to, to look at this event, and we're going to talk about some critical things, some critical truths that I think are very applicable, and then we're going to continue on uh, looking at this text next week. So if you're reading along... I'm in Acts chapter 2, and I'm just going to set the stage. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, but in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house in which they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Verse 7, they were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Let's jump down to verse 12. Then they stood amazed and perplexed. What could this mean, they asked one another. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you. Fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people aren't drunk, as some of you are assuming. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes the scripture. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Verse 18, in those days I will pour out my spirit even on my serv servants, men and women alike, they will prophesy and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, the new moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. Verse 21, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's jump over to um, verse 41. We'll talk more about what happens right after this, but I want you to see in verse 41, it says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. That's huge. That was the launching of the church. Now, again, I'm going to take some time today. I'm just going to be really patient with this. And that's why we're taking two Sundays. Don't worry. We're, we're going to get out here on time today. But I just, I wanted us to linger in what's really going on here. Pentecost means 50th. And it gets its name, it's a, that's a Greek terminology, but what's its, it's getting its name and it's representing that this was the 50th day that took place after Passover. 
Now, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, the nation of Israel was instructed to keep three feasts every year. Three feasts. They had the Passover feast. They had what's called the Feast of Weeks. And it got its name from the fact that seven is the perfect number, so it was a, a feast of the perfect number of weeks, which is seven. So 49 days plus one. One day after seven weeks from Passover, that day was marked, and that was another festival called the Feast of Weeks, and it was set aside to honor the Lord of the harvest. It was set aside to honor God and to recognize and offer up first fruits of the crops that were just beginning to come in during that time. It was one of the three feasts that God said, I want you to remember that I'm your source. I want you to remember this. Now, the other, one of the others that we're really familiar with is the Passover feast. What a hugely significant feast, the Passover. And we're not going to take a lot of time to talk about this today, but... But you know that the Passover represented God's providing freedom for his people. He provided an atonement, a redemption, and a way out from the bondage that they were in. Now, here's the deal. Jesus ministered on the earth for 30-ish years. We don't know exactly how long. 30-something years. Do you think it's any coincidence that the, the, the apex of his ministry, the, the point in which his ministry was so well known, so widespread, so impactful, and by the way, the religious leaders were so fed up with it, that the time in which Jesus would lay down his life to become that atonement, to, to provide the way for us to, to, to be released from bondage? Do you think it was an accident that that happened on Passover weekend? You know, God is above space and time, and there's, there's no way. You know, that, that intensity of resistance to Jesus could have happened at any time. It could have happened six months before. But it got to the point in which Jesus would lay down his life, and that happened during Passover, hugely symbolic that Jesus became the Passover lamb that would create that opportunity for us to be free in him. Now, in the same way, the Holy Spirit comes. Really? It's a coincidence? It's an accident that exactly 50 days later, when all of Israel is setting time aside to recognize that God is the God of the harvest and that they should be offering up a first fruits offering to God, that the Holy Spirit comes at that exact time? I think God planned it. To reinforce the incredible significance Peter, I just read in verse 41, at the end of Peter's preaching, 3,000 people. This is the first fruits of the harvest, of the first launching of the church. So it's not an accident. There's lots of imagery. And so that's what I want to do today, is I want to talk briefly over the next few minutes about what was significant about the harvest I think a lot of times when we think about Pentecost, we think right about the, we just go straight to the Holy Spirit and we think, think straight about the gifts, and we're going to talk about that next week, but we don't want to miss the hugely significant component that the harvest was why they were gathering to begin with. All throughout Jesus' ministry, he is using the, the imagery and the symbolism of the harvest. Parable after parable after parable, story after story, 
Sermon example after sermon example, Jesus keeps going back to the harvest. The harvest was hugely a part of Jesus's, the things that he talked about, the things that he taught on. And, and we could pick any number of, of scriptures where he talks about the harvest. But one of my favorite is in John chapter 4. If you'll turn to John chapter 4, you, you probably recognize this story. It's about the Samaritan woman. And we're going to pick up in verse 25. We're not going to talk about the whole exchange between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. It was a powerful exchange where Jesus uh, reached out in a loving way. He communicated truth. And and we're going to pick up towards the end of that exchange in verse 25. The Samaritan woman said, She's talking to Jesus. It's just the two of them. I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came, streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have the kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Verse 34, then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of my father who sent me and from finishing his work. You know that saying four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe. The harvester are paid good wages and get this. And the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. It's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant and others had already done the work. And now you will go and you'll gather the harvest. This is one of the most powerful passages in scripture in which Jesus blatantly ties the harvest to what he's really talking about. Do you know throughout Jesus's ministry, often he talked in parables and sometimes people walked away scratching their head and they're like, I'm not quite sure what he was talking about. This is one of those places in which Jesus says, A equals B. Let me take the guesswork out of this for you. I know I'm talking a lot about the harvest, but let me take the guesswork out of this. And he says this in Verse 36, it says the fruit that they harvest is people brought to eternal life. That's the harvest. That's why it's so significant, I believe, that the Holy Spirit came during a festival in which people were recognizing that the fruit actually comes from God and that we need to honor God. Because when Jesus says the fruit is that actually people are coming into eternal life, that's what Jesus is concerned about from day one. He's not concerned about the physical harvest. He's not concerned. Yes, he he does take care of us. And God uses a number of ways to, to make sure that we're provided for. And certainly in that culture, the harvest was a source of provision. And yes, he's concerned about that. Primarily, Jesus was always concerned about the real harvest, and that's the condition of people's heart. And that they would come into eternal life. And make no question about it, God, Jesus says, it's God's will that I do this. It's God's will. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And by the way, in In case you're confused, disciples, let me just make it clear what we're doing is we're bringing people into the kingdom of God. That's what we're doing. Oh, and just to make it absolutely clear that this actually applies to you too, that this isn't just some kind of theoretical thing that we're talking about, he goes on to say, 
Verse 37, you know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant, and others had already done the work, and now you will gather at the harvest. He's basically saying, you know what, at whatever point you come into the process, you still have a role to play. You may be the person who planted the seed initially, and then you never, you don't see it. You may be, you may come into the point right now, and by right now I mean perhaps, um, you know, the, the, the festival in which they're celebrating first fruits when you're just starting to see the harvest. Or you may be a laborer in the harvest in the months to come. No matter where you're joining the process, you have a role in the harvest. And what's interesting about the, the, the Feast of Weeks what are they doing? They're celebrating the first fruits. So they're just starting to see. And this was, the, this was when several different grains would start to produce their first fruits. Barley was one of those grains that would just start to produce. And they would just start to harvest. And then they would set this time aside and they would do a special offering and they would worship God. But you know what's interesting about that? There was a lot of work that took place before they got to that, section, that, that moment in time. There was a lot of work that took place before they ever saw the first fruits. And guess what? There was a lot of work that was going to take place after that point, too. You know, we live in a very, you know, uh, agrarian region right here. And, and many of you are much more familiar about agriculture than I am. But I know this, that when the harvest first starts, job's not done. There's still a lot of work. There's still a lot of work ahead. And so Jesus is making it very clear. I'm all about people coming into eternal life. And by the way, you are going to be a part of that process. Now, let me just bring it really close to home for us here in this room and those of you who are worshiping with us online. Because this applies to to you as well. And I don't know how many of you are joining us online, but I, I praise God for you. And we are, we are worshiping together and our hearts are with you. And I also praise God for those of you who chose to come in physically today. But this is for all of us who are hearing this. What is God calling us to do right here in Fresno? What is God, God calling us to to do. Let me bring this really close to home by going to one of my other favorite texts on the harvest, and this is in Matthew. And this is in Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus, um, we, we jump into the scene in verse 35, and it says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Zero in. Listen to verse 37 and 38. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers to go into the fields. So let me ask you something that I'm asking myself. Will I go? You know, it's interesting. Jesus is saying, pray. You know, the harvest is it's out there in front of us. Pray that God will send workers for the harvest. And again, what did we read the harvest is? It's people coming into eternal life. And that's you and me going into that harvest and participating in what God is doing in people's lives. And he's saying, pray, pray that God will send workers. And, and I want to bring it really close to home. And I, I want to say, let's pray that God sends us. I don't know where your comfort level is on that spectrum. But we need to pray that God enables us to step in to this. 
now more than ever, in a world that's so in need of hope, so in need of truth, so in need of freedom. And, and let's not be the, the ones that just pray, God, will you send somebody to them? Will, will we start praying, God, will you show me how I need to step into being a worker in the harvest? God, begin to do that in me. You know why? Because I, I, I realize that there may be some who are tuning in here this morning and uh, listening, and they may not have made the decision to follow Jesus yet. I realize that, and that's one of the things about being online. And there may be people I still don't, I'm still learning everybody here, so I don't know where everybody's at in their journey. So I don't want to assume that everybody hearing this has already made the decision to follow Jesus and that they're a Christian. But I know that a many, many of those that are hearing me right now have already decided to follow Jesus. And we're sitting on some pretty amazing news. And I love the way the, the New Living Translation puts Romans 3.23 and 3.24. And I want to I wanna just... You've, you've heard me quote this scripture before. It's one of my favorite scriptures, but... But listen to this. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes who? Us. Right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Now if you're a Christian today, you've experienced that, that undeserved freedom. What are we doing with that knowledge? It's not just for us. Jesus is saying, it's the will of God that I do what? That I enter into the harvest, and by the way, you need to participate in that. And we have this truth. And there is a world out there that needs that truth. There is a city. Let's, let's bring it closer to home. We talk about the world, but let's bring it closer to home. There is a city that needs that truth. And I just want to encourage us. How strategic is this moment in our church's history? As we have an opportunity, as all of society is starting to re-engage what life looks like, we as, as a church have the opportunity to look around us and see that the harvest is ripe. Look around us and pray that the God of the harvest will help us step into the need. And I'm telling you, the need is great and the opportunity is great. Like every time I come up here, I drive past this acreage which is right next to our church property. And every time I come up here, there's new developments, and, and now I see that they've already marked out the streets, and I, as I understand it, there's going to be like 200 homes right here. Literally, we could walk out of our driveway and walk into that neighborhood. Are we going to be ready in a year when there's tons of homes? Are we going to be ready? You know, Karen and I, we've been looking around for housing, and, and praise God, I think we got that almost figured out. But, but there's also, because we're getting to know the area, and there's also another brand new neighborhood, maybe three quarters of a mile, just on the other side, right here. And a brand new high school just past that. This church is strategically located. Are we going to be willing to step in to what God is calling us to do? And, and please don't hear me like trying to beat us up this morning. I'm just saying we have an opportunity. I want you to be encouraged about the possibility of what God is calling us into as a church into this next season. And you may be like, well, okay, I hear you, Greg. I understand that. I, I, I don't disagree, but um, I don't know if I can do this. 
I see, I see the great need for the harvest. How am I going to do this? In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, Jesus, before he ascends, gathers his followers, and he says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. You know what? I can't do this in my own power. I'm kind of an outgoing person, but I realize that not, a, not everybody is like really comfortable just talking with, with, with a complete stranger or, or even if they're not a stranger, crossing that threshold and now talking about God? I realize not everybody is comfortable doing that. And by the way, this is not a personality thing. None of us should do this in our own strength or just because we have a certain personality. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So what I've hoped is that this morning that you will begin to think about the great need and the great opportunity because when we understand the great need of the harvest, my hope and prayer is that it will create in us a desire to get the power to move into what God is calling us to do. So as we close this morning, I just want to encourage you to come back next week because next week we're going to dive back into Pentecost. And we're going to talk about the power because a lot of times I think when people think about the Holy Spirit and they think about the Pentecost, they immediately go to the gifts. The original intention that the Holy Spirit would come was would to empower for God's work. And again, we can't do that on our own. We need, we desperately need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for us to step into what God has for you and me in this season. So next week, we're going to dive into Acts 2 again. So I hope you join us. Let's pray. God, we come before you. God, and we just want to step into this, this moment this season in the way that you would have us step into it, God. God, we celebrate what you have done and we celebrate what you are going to do. But God, we cannot do this in our own strength. We want to even want to try. But God, I just pray that you would just begin to birth in us a renewed heart for people around us who are so needy and so desperate and we are sitting on the most powerful truth. God, give us the boldness. Give us the appropriateness to know how to step in. It's going to look different for different people. And give us that spirit of Issachar, the tribe that was complimented for discerning the time and knowing what they should do. God, we don't want to, we don't want to step out in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own ideas. God, we need you. So God, we just invite your Holy Spirit. I invite your Holy Spirit into this moment right now. God, we don't have to wait for next Sunday to talk about it. God, we ask for the empowerment of your Spirit right now. God, begin to open our eyes to the harvest that is before us, God. God, and I thank you that we can join in the process at any part. We don't have to be the one that initially planted. We don't have to be the one that sees the harvest across the finish line. But God, help us to be willing to step into this season, however you would have us do that, God. And I thank you for every person here today. I thank you for every person tuning in online. I thank you for truth. 
I thank you that you are the God of the harvest and we worship you and we honor you and we praise you. We give you all the glory in the mighty and the powerful and the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as you go out in your week, can I just encourage you? Look around you. Look around you. God will bring opportunities to you. May you be blessed. May you be in health. May this be an amazing week. And if you don't have to work tomorrow, may you be incredibly refreshed, even if you have to work. So God bless you.